Sherlock Holmes, The Rediscovered Railway Mysteries and Other Stories, by John Taylor, read by Benedict Cumberbatch. An Inscrutable Masquerade. In a drawer, in the bureau of an upstairs room of my current home, there is a locked cedar wood box, which I inherited as a youth from my grandfather. This is, one might say, my box of secrets. When I was young, it contained the treasures of boyhood, a catapult, a lump of beeswax, the carapace of a crab. For many years since, it has been the repository of an archive, admittedly a ragged and disordered archive, a collection of notes and scribblings concerning some of the many cases of my lifelong friend, the consulting detective Sherlock Holmes, which, for one reason or another, I never took the trouble to write into proper reports. Having had recently a little time on my hands, I reopened this box of yellowing notebooks, and it seemed to me that several of the cases, given the ocean of time between those events and the present day, would now bear telling. And I begin by chronicling an adventure which I may have dismissed for several reasons, not because it lacked baffling and intriguing elements, on the contrary, but mostly, I think, because it was for me personally such a dizzying and distressing experience. It was a Wednesday evening in July, at the end of a day of straight-jacketing heat, and I sat next to the open window of our parlour at Baker Street, drinking in the air and hoping for the liberating ripple of a breeze. The newspaper on my lap reported the release from police custody of a known criminal, Tobias Organ, arrested some days previously for the murder of Max Zimmerman, a moneylender shot through the head in his small apartment in Wardour Street. In the end, there had been insufficient evidence to charge Organ with murder— even though the police clearly thought him culpable. Strangely enough, I had once met Organ myself. He had come to me as a patient suffering, as I recall, from a severe lesion to the lower back, which he maintained had been caused by a fall against a metal stanchion, but which I had little doubt was in fact a stab wound. My diagnosis was supported, I believe, by his barely veiled threat that I should under no circumstances make known his injury to anyone else. He had an unforgettable, menacing way with him, and I had felt immense relief when he left my surgery. I'd been looking forward to discussing the organ case with Holmes, who would certainly have some views on the subject, but when he finally appeared for dinner he was irritable and uncommunicative, and from these symptoms I guessed him to be in the process of some taxing mental work. All the same, I had no wish to sit out the meal in silence. "'Stifling weather to be out and about, Holmes,' I said, peppering a slice of beef. "'Indeed, Watson, and equally stifling to be in.' He busied himself with cutting into a potato. After a while I said, "'I've not seen you today. I presume you were somewhere on business.' "'Yes, Watson, I was.' Another pause, the chink of cutlery. "'Somewhere local?' "'Somewhere very local, Watson. I'd expect you'd like to know where.' Well, I, I have no wish to be intrusive. In the basement. I've been all day in the basement of our house, and since your desire not to be intrusive is clearly struggling against your overwhelming curiosity to know, I will tell you why I was there. And he paused and smiled, in the full confidence that you will not breathe a word to a soul about it. Why, Holmes, of course not, and on the understanding that if I do tell you, you will not be able to leave this house until my work is complete. What? I put down, almost dropped, my knife and fork. You don't mean not leave at all? That's precisely what I mean. So it may be that you would prefer to forego my secret rather than consent to becoming a prisoner here for what might be several days. Hopelessly intrigued, I gave no thought to the discomfort of being shut indoors in this sultry heat, no thought to the boredom, not even any thought to the fact that I had appointments in my diary. I am prepared to abide by your request, Holmes. He stood up from the table, his meal unfinished, and went across to the hearth to retrieve his pipe and tobacco pouch. As he filled his pipe and lit it, he sank into his armchair. I believe you have been preoccupied with the case of Tobias Organ, Watson. 
Yes, it has been on my mind. How? You twice left the newspaper open at that page. The moneylender Zimmerman, a legitimate businessman with a wife and young children, was murdered with an army rifle. The police have many reasons for believing Tobias Organ to be guilty of the crime, and one of these is that he owns an army rifle. Organ, of course, denies that his firearm is the murder weapon. Well, yes, I said, one would expect he would. But suppose, said Holmes, suppose there was a science which could with certainty tie a bullet to the gun which fired it. Well, that would be marvellous, I said. But there isn't, is there? Well, Watson, let us say that such a science is seminal. It is exactly this problem which I am wrestling with at present in the basement of the house. I've set up a laboratory of sorts down there where I can conduct some experiments. Progress is promising, and if the results are as I expect, they will certainly send Tobias Organ to the gallows. But Organ is an utterly ruthless villain, undoubtedly guilty of a number of murders, but devious enough always to palm them off on others. If he were to gain even an inkling of my work, we would be in the utmost danger. I can see that you would be in danger, Holmes, but how might I be? As I say, Watson, Organ is ruthless. To get at any enemy, his favourite trick is to abduct someone close to his adversary, often with, I'm afraid, horrific consequences. You know too much now, and since I'm not prepared to put you at risk in that way, I fear you must sit it out in these apartments. You must not answer the door, you must stay away from the windows, no visitors. You must lead the life of a prisoner until such time as this matter is settled. Well, I said, it might be good for me. I have a medical paper to write, and the period of confinement might induce me to keep my nose to my studies. Excellent, Watson. I'm sure your sacrifice will not be in vain. I really did not see myself sacrificing very much at all. I spent the evening cancelling all appointments of the following week, and went to bed rather looking forward to a few days of fruitful incarceration. The morning found me in a hopeful mood in what appeared to be an empty house. Holmes, I presumed, had already descended to his basement laboratory. Our landlady, Mrs. Hudson, had left me a pleasant, cold breakfast, an indication that she herself had had to leave the house early. The day, while already warm and bright, had not yet begun to turn oppressive. The clock over the hearth ticked slowly as I settled down to my books, experiencing for the first time since my student years some of the quiet ecstasy of study. By midday the room had become hot. My concentration meandered and thirst plagued me. I wandered downstairs to Mrs. Hudson's apartment and found her still absent, so I proceeded down to the basement to ask Holmes whether he knew what arrangements had been made for lunch. The door to the basement was shut, and when I tried the handle, I found it to be locked. From within, I could hear the occasional crack of what sounded like a gun being fired, and the grind of metal on metal like ball bearings rolling round an iron bowl. Holmes, are you there? Watson, what are you doing here? I'm in the process of an investigation. Indeed? Yes, I'm trying to find out what's happening about luncheon. You'll have to prepare something for yourself, he called back. I'm afraid I've sent Mrs. Hudson away. I cannot risk the lives of innocent people. And Watson, be so good as to keep away from the basement. Confine yourself to our own rooms and to the kitchen. There's a good fellow. Very well, Holmes, but yes? I really would very much like a newspaper. I'm afraid you must do without. Neither of us can take the chance of leaving here until this business is complete. Now, please, let me get on. I trundled to the kitchen. I managed to find myself some bread and cheese, which I took back upstairs. Our rooms were now very hot, and since I was forbidden to sit near the window, I ate my luncheon over my books, dropping crumbs into the creases of Grey's anatomy and beginning to feel restless. After lunch, I managed to force myself to a little more work, but by three o'clock had fallen asleep in the armchair. I woke to hear the sounds of evening traffic moving along Baker Street. I listened with something like envy to the busy hubbub of those who were free to come and go, who had families to return to, and simple feasts awaiting them at convivial tables. My lot seemed bleak by comparison. Holmes did not emerge from his infernal basement, and Mrs. Hudson did not appear with an evening meal. I cannot recall how the rest of the evening passed. The heat absorbed during the day by London's pavements now radiated back to thicken the evening air. 
The world outside, of which I had no news, became gradually silent, and I, hungry and disconsolate, went finally to bed. The next morning, after a makeshift breakfast, I got down to some work, and was well into the argument of the paper I was writing, when I began to realize that the room was again beginning to become airless and oven-like. Determined not to succumb to lethargy as I had the previous afternoon, I decided that despite Holmes's strict embargo on going near the window, I simply must have some air. As I raised the sash, I saw a cab approaching along Baker Street and stopping directly beneath the window. The passenger who stepped out was Nicholas Cartwright, an old university friend now writing for the Times. I hadn't seen him for a couple of months, and he seemed about to pay a surprise visit. Desperate as I was for company, I could not forget the promise I had made to Holmes to admit no visitors. The doorbell rang. My first idea was to wait for Cartwright to give up and go away, but there quickly came a second ring, and with it a call from the street through the now open window. Watson! A note of anxiety in his voice, suggesting that all was not well. Cartwright was a good friend. I did not see how I could linger there pretending to be deaf when he might be in need of my help. I dashed down the stairs and opened the front door. Watson, so pleased to have found you. The statement immediately struck me as odd, as did Cartwright's whole demeanour, but mindful of the proximity of Holmes in his makeshift laboratory, I whispered, Look, old chap, odd things are going on. Come up, as quietly as you can, I'll explain there. A sudden sharp crack issued from the depths of the house, and I hoped that, preoccupied as he was, Holmes would have no inkling of the presence of my visitor. As we entered the parlour and shut the door, Cartwright said, "'Watson, I've been worried about you. I didn't even know if I'd find you here.' "'Worried?' "'Yes. The story in the Gazette regarding yourself and Mr. Holmes. Did you know it was in the papers?' "'Cartwright, I haven't the least idea what you're talking about, and as for newspapers, I haven't seen one in days. Here,' he tossed me the paper, open at about the third or fourth page, and I read the following headline and accompanying article. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson part company? After several years of celebrated collaboration, the eminent consulting detective Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his medical companion Dr. John Watson have terminated their professional partnership and it seems simultaneously ended their personal friendship? Mr. Holmes said that while he continued to hold Dr. Watson in high esteem, and to regard him as a man of exceptional honour and professional competence, circumstances upon which he could not and would not elaborate had made it expedient for them to go their separate ways. <laughs> there was no comment from Dr. Watson. I stood for a moment, holding the newspaper and averting my gaze from Cartwright. Who had written this? Did Holmes know about it? Was there some truth in it? Was Holmes's exile to the basement a way of keeping me at bay while he found alternative lodgings? This is today's Gazette? Yes, Watson. I see you knew nothing about this. Am I speaking to you as a friend, Cartwright, or as a journalist? Well, I suppose, unfortunately, as a friend, John. I say unfortunately because this is clearly a damned good story. But if you wish to talk to me off the record, so be it. Off the record, then. I know nothing of this. And I don't know whether Holmes has had a hand in it. He's conducting some very secret business at present, and possibly it's connected to that. That's all I can tell you, I'm afraid. One thing does baffle me, Cartwright said. How did the Gazette get the story without us getting it too? Anyway, I won't make anything of this, John, until you give me the go-ahead. But I hope if there does turn out to be an exclusive... You'll be the one to get it, I said. Thank you, Nicholas. I saw him down the stairs and closed the front door behind him, finding myself relieved that he had gone. I had no idea that I would be seeing him again soon under even more peculiar circumstances. But determined that now I must confront Holmes with this business, I knocked on the door of the basement. Holmes! A long silence. Holmes! We must speak. Not now, Watson. Holmes, there's something I must discuss with you urgently. Something in the newspaper. There was a scuffling and the basement door opened. Newspaper? How did you get a newspaper? 
Cartwright called. He'd seen an article. Yes, Holmes interrupted. Yes, the article. I dare say you would appreciate an explanation. Give me half an hour. A little later we sat opposite one another in our sitting room. The evening was still close and oppressive. The newspaper article, said Holmes, was an unfortunate necessity. I hope it has not caused you too much embarrassment, Watson, and when this business is finished all will be rectified. But why, I said, report us as having quarrelled. Bear with me, Watson, I beg of you. As you know, I have tried to keep my work here secret, but how certain can one be of that? The police are involved in these matters and are aware of my experiments, and who knows whether some junior or even senior member of the force is not in league with that utterly ruthless villain. Now, having been alerted to that newspaper report, might it not be the case that Tobias Organ would assume that you were no longer in London? At any rate, he would certainly be likely to assume you were no longer sharing these premises with me. You gave the story to the Gazette to protect me? Yes, Watson. That was my purpose. I just wish that you'd consulted me first. You were not supposed even to know about it, Watson. And if you had not had a visit from Cartwright, you would never have seen the article. It was unfortunate that he came when he did. It was the article that brought him. Yes, a miscalculation on my part. Now, it is late, work to do tomorrow, and I must insist on extracting from you another guarantee. What's that, Holmes? that you will not, under any circumstances, interrupt my work again. It's all very delicate, and a disturbance at an inopportune moment could ruin everything. Is that clear? Not under any circumstance. That night I lay awake in the muggy heat, the bedclothes pulled back and grieved for what I calculated to be the death of my reputation. At least I imagined that's how the world would see it, or at least that portion of the world that reads the London Gazette. Holmes and Watson have parted company, but there is no comment from Watson, only a nobly worded valediction from the great detective. Such bitter thoughts polluted my restless waking and tormented my subsequent dreams. And added to all this, there lay a sense that things were still not clear, that something crucial remained unspoken. I woke early, but exhausted. Without going near the window, I took in what I could of the wakening day. The street was quiet. I dressed slowly and descended to the kitchen to find something to eat. The rattles and sharp cracks of Holmes's experiments had already come to life below in the basement, and I wondered whether he had even bothered to go to bed. I was making a pot of tea when the doorbell sounded. The noises from the cellar did not pause, so I assumed that Holmes had not heard the bell. I could see nothing of the front of the house from the kitchen, but after I had taken a few steps up into the lobby, it became clear by means of a side window that the visitor was once again Nicholas Cartwright. I went to the door and admitted him. Cartwright? What's going on, Watson? What do you mean? I mean, what game is being played here? Cartwright? I've no idea what you're referring to. You'd better come up. He was, I could tell, steaming with anger, though I had no idea what I could have done to arouse it. He would not sit. He stood with his arms behind his back, a man preparing to deliver an accusation. You told me you were inescapably confined to this house. Yes, Cartwright, and so I have been. This is the third day. Excluding yesterday night, you mean? No. I was here yesterday night, too, tossing and turning in my bed at the thought of my ruined reputation. Watson, see here. Yesterday you prevailed upon my friendship by confiding in me matters which, as a journalist, I considered more than worthy of publication. Had I known that you were deceiving me, Cartwright, you have my word, I was not deceiving you. I have not left this house since Monday afternoon. So you have a twin brother? No, I do not. Then please explain to me, who was the man outside the restaurant at Marlebone Station at five past midnight? I take it he resembled me. More than resembled. I do hope you're being truthful with me, Watson. I could see that his suspicions were not allayed. 
I even began to wonder whether my restless period of waking the previous night had itself been a dream, and whether I had been sleepwalking. Such things are possible, I know, and the heat, my fatigue, and the events of the last days had left me so baffled that in that moment of confusion I could not entirely rule it out. What happened, he said, was that I was walking through the station concourse when I spotted you by the wall of the restaurant, which by then was closed, talking to a man in a brown felt hat. I would have approached you, but when I caught your eye, you cut me as dead as if you didn't know me, and I assumed your conversation was of some importance. The more I thought about it, the more I thought it was a poor way to treat a good friend. Suddenly the fog in my brain gave way to an horrific clarity. I knew that I must rid myself of Cartwright at once. "'Thank you for telling me this,' I said. "'It is of the utmost importance. But, Nicholas, and I pray you won't take this amiss, I must ask you to leave.' "'To leave?' "'Please. This is a fearfully serious business. There is real danger.' You're not just trying to get me out of the way, Watson. That's exactly what I'm trying to do, Cartwright, but for a very good reason. Believe me, you will have your story. <sighs> very well, John. Very well. At the front door, he patted me amiably on the shoulder. I shut the door on him and leaned against the wall, trying to get my thoughts in order. Holmes had instructed me not under any circumstances to trouble him again— Yet this situation was possibly critical. If Tobias Organ had hired some impersonated look and sound so like me that even Cartwright, who had known me for years, could be convinced, then Holmes might also be deceived, and then what power they would have in their hands. If I could not speak to Holmes, I could at least alert him by other means. I ran up the stairs with the idea of writing a note which I could slip under the basement door— but as I reached our rooms, I heard a cry from the street. Without thinking, I ran to the parlour window. A hundred yards southwards, along Baker Street, three men were struggling. Two of them were bundling the third man into a cab against his will. It was Cartwright. I dashed down the stairs and ran into the street. The driver of the cab had already whipped up the horse and moved off at a lick, but I gave chase, fury and outrage, fuming my progress. I pursued them for a good half a mile until eventually they outpaced me and I stood gasping for breath outside St. Vincent's Church. I sat on the pavement. I needed Holmes's help. The transgression of a broken promise was a trivial thing, surely in the context of this appalling incident. I would go to him immediately. Aware that... In the haste of my pursuit, I had left the front door of the house open. A new anxiety overcame me. Clearly this kidnap was the work of Organ's ruffians, and who was to say that they would not take advantage of an open door? I trotted as briskly as I could back to Baker Street. But the door was no longer open, and on such a close and windless day I thought it unlikely it had been closed by a draught. The horrible thought occurred to me that someone— may have already got in, and then everything seemed to tumble into place. Cartwright's abduction had been intended to draw me out of the house so that the man masquerading as myself could gain entry. Holmes would be unaware of this. He would eventually open the door of the basement to his assailant, and believing it was myself he was admitting, would offer the easiest of targets. I had left the house without a key, but I knew there was a possibility of access via the rear of the terrace. This entailed my knocking at the door of our neighbour, Mrs. Harbin, an elderly, amiable woman who seemed happy to allow me access to the rear of the building. Here I was obliged to scale a wall to the yard outside the back of our own dingy basement, the front room being that which Holmes had taken for his makeshift laboratory. There was no light within. I opened the door with infinite slowness. The noise of Holmes's experiments seemed to have stopped. The door that connected this room to the front half of the basement was six or seven short paces away, but it was too dark to see whether the bare floorboards were liable to move and groan when I trod upon them. I tested each step before lowering my weight, 
and moved with the floating motion of a rather overweight pantomime artist. One, two, three. Then there was movement behind me. A hand was clamped across my mouth and an arm locked around my throat. The grip was expert. I could not breathe or move. The hot breath of my assailant in my ear whispered, Doctor, do not cry out. I'm going to release you and you will turn round slowly and face me. You must not make a sound. Tap my hand if you understand. I reached up to the hand around my throat and obediently I tapped it. The arm released me, and as quietly as I could, I took a deep draught of air, turning as I did so. Lestrade! Shh! Yes, Doctor. Wasn't expecting you here. Or rather, in a sense I was, but since you are just about to arrive, I wasn't expecting you to come in the back way as well. The policeman smirked at his little conundrum. Will you explain to me? I began. What on earth you mean? Not now, Doctor, he said. Glad you're here, though, sir. An additional pair of ears. Up close to the door now and listen, it won't be long. It was indeed less than a minute before we heard the door from the front of the house opening into the laboratory and the arrival of what sounded like two men. The door was closed with a thump and a gruff voice said, So this is it? Yes, this is where he's working. There was something familiar about that second voice. And he won't be back for a while? No, half an hour, I should think. At that moment, with a shock, I recognized the other voice. It was my own. I turned to Lestrade again, but he just put his finger to his lips and indicated that I should continue to listen. So what's the plan, then? asked the gruff voice within. To match the bullet that killed Maximum with the ones from your gun, said my voice. The police know you killed him, but they need homes to provide them with evidence that will convince a jury. Evidently, I thought, the gruff character is Tobias Organ. I heard him pace about, then spit noisily. Zimmerman's not the first one I've topped, and they've never got me yet. They say you only got four pounds ten shillings from him. Never you mind what I got. Anyway, I never killed him just for the money. I killed him because he gave me a bad look. He gave me a bad look, and I gave him a bad headache. A bullet right between the eyes. Now, let's deal with this little problem. Suddenly there was a tumultuous crash, as if one of the walls had fallen in. In we go, Doctor, said Lestrade. He pushed the door hard and we rushed into the laboratory where Organ had kicked Holmes's equipment flying in all directions and where, to my amazement, I saw that he was now being attacked by myself. A perfect duplicate of me cracked him a right hook, then a left hook, and then felled him with a blow to the side of the head. Organ hit the floor like a sack of cabbages. Lestrade was on him in a flash, cuffing Organ's arms behind his back. Lestrade blew his whistle and then proceeded to arrest him. As I stood back to get a better look at my other self, the duplicate doctor put a hand to his own face, wrenched at his upper brow, and pulled and stretched until he had removed his entire face, revealing beneath the peeling mask the flaming eyes of Sherlock Holmes. The next moment Lestrade's officers came bursting through the basement door, and Tobias Organ was dragged away. The heat of the day had given way at last to a pleasant evening. Mrs. Hudson had returned to the house and provided Holmes and myself with an excellent evening meal. Now we sat with our brandies, and Holmes with his pipe at the open window, where a gentle breeze lifted the curtains and refreshed the parlour. As you will have deduced, Holmes was saying by way of explaining it all to me, the object of the masquerade was to lure Organ somewhere where we could extract a confession from him by subterfuge. But your ballistics experiments, I said, would they not have been enough to convict him? It is a science only in the imagination, Holmes said. And though one day I'm certain it will be more than that, there is much more work to do than I could accomplish in a fortnight. But Lestrade and I agree that if Organ believed himself to be at risk from my experiments, he would wish to destroy them. What on earth were you doing in there, Holmes, if the thing was a complete hoax? I'm afraid I did deceive you a little. I was not in there all the time. 
The mechanism of an old railway clock and a device employing elastic and a drum skin were intended to give the ear the impression of ongoing industry. Well, it certainly deceived me, I said. But was it really necessary for me to be incarcerated for the duration? I'm afraid so, my friend. If Organ through one of his spies had got wind that there were two Watsons, the trick would not have worked. What's more, it was necessary for him to believe that you and I had quarrelled, and therefore that the good Dr. Watson might be in the market for a bit of betrayal. Unfortunately, your friend Cartwright saw me meeting Organ's accomplice at Malibone Station, and almost let the cat out of the bag. It was necessary for us to put him somewhere safe. Lestrade's men kindly subjected him to a temporary and very comfortable period of kidnap. It was you who had him dragged away. Yes. I had not calculated that you would follow him, of course, or that you would be locked out and find yourself clambering in through the back. But it turned out well. You will make an additional witness for the prosecution. Do you think they'll convict him? Oh, yes, Watson. His confession today was as clear as a bell. Tobias Organ will hang. As for you, my friend, I have given you a terrible time, and as a reward, I am going to take you to the opera. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Gilbert and Sullivan. The Mikado. But, Holmes, my memory is you don't much like Gilbert and Sullivan. No, Watson, but you do. And besides, I have to confess to having a soft spot for the Lord High Executioner. The Conundrum of Coach 13 On an October morning, when rain streamed from the black clouds that swept above our Baker Street lodgings, I found my friend Sherlock Holmes in a similarly overcast mood. He had not had a case in weeks, not at least what he called a decent case, and he had been huffing and puffing about the house for two days. It was with some relief to both of us, therefore, that we heard the slowing approach of a cab in the street outside, and both moved eagerly to the window. The hansom did indeed stop directly beside our door, and after a moment a large and finely dressed middle-aged gentleman emerged into the downpour, paid his fare, and rang our doorbell. Holmes was smiling. Now what could make a rich American so distressed, Watson, that he would come pell-mell here to us from Paddington? An American, I said, drawn irresistibly as usual into Holmes's tantalizing games. Certainly, and I think a formidable character. And do you wish to tell me how you deduce all that, Holmes? I deduce his distress and his nationality from the fact that he just tried to pay the cabbie in American dollars before recalling which pocket held his pounds sterling. As for his coming from Paddington, that was the easiest of all, for the driver of the hansom is Henry Brown, I'm surprised you do not recognize him, who always works from the Paddington rank. As ever, Watson, I apologize for the banality of these observations, but you did ask. By now there were footsteps on the stairs, as Mrs. Hudson escorted the visitor to our apartment. While I inwardly delighted to note that my friend had returned to his amiable best in anticipation of a new challenge, I found myself praying that it would be a challenge worthy of his powers and his pent-up energies. No sooner had the door opened than the huge, rotund figure of our visitor, bright in a cream suit, burst into the room like an actor onto a stage determined to establish his character instantly. "'Mr. Holmes!' boomed the American voice as both his arms swept forward to grasp my right hand. "'Benedict Masterson, what a great privilege to meet you!' "'Delighted, but I am Dr. John Watson,' I replied." This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. With equally booming apologies, he bowed charmingly to me and turned to my friend. Ah, yes, now I see. Unmistakable, unmistakable. The impression given was that he had found the first Sherlock Holmes of his acquaintance a little short of his expectations. Mr. Holmes, I wish to ask you to act for me in a business both mysterious and distressing. You had better sit down, Mr. Masterson, said Holmes, and tell us everything. 
and having settled his cream-covered bulk into an armchair and accepted a cigar, on which he continued to puff anxiously as he spoke, the American told us his story. I am a dealer in gold, gentlemen. Gold has been my life. My father owned small mines in Nevada, which gave us a comfortable living. In my turn, through judicious trading, I've made these assets yield a fortune. I came to London last week because your own Bank of England had made an order for a substantial quantity of gold bars to boost its reserves. The bullion was shipped in a Bristol harbor and transferred yesterday onto a chartered London train for transfer to the bank. I have been in London doing the paperwork, of which there is, let me assure you, no small amount. And I went to Paddington this morning to meet the consignment. The train was there. The gold was not. I see, said Holmes. Stolen. Undoubtedly. How much? We're talking four or five millions, Mr. Holmes. That's a large loss. Is the gold insured? Indeed it is, but you know insurance companies, Mr. Holmes. They are ever suspicious, and the circumstances of the gold's disappearance are, to say the least, rather strange. The details, Mr. Masterson, said my friend, if you please. Well, continued Masterson, tapping a thick cylinder of ash into the ashtray, I had asked to commission a special, an overnight train, and also insisted that it be discreet not armored or escorted or in any way having the appearance of a specially secured conveyance. I was offered the charter of a passenger train which returns empty from Bristol to London once a week, and which railwaymen jokingly call the bad luck special. Not because anything has ever happened to it, but because it normally consists of thirteen empty passenger coaches, as indeed it did on this occasion. I insisted that the gold be packed in steel containers, each locked with a unique key. You will appreciate that gold itself, gentlemen, is a weighty metal. So each box contained only as many bars as would enable the containers to be carried. In order to prevent the possibility of them being removed from the moving train, I ensured that while it was small enough to go through the open carriage door, they were too large to pass through the windows, even with the windows slid down to their largest aperture. I then arranged for the doors of the bullion carriage to be locked from the outside so they could not be open until the train reached London. The train was empty then, apart from the driver and farmer of the locomotive? No, Mr. Holmes. It is railway practice for all trains to have a guard a practice I was very happy to comply with since it meant my consignment would have an overseer throughout its journey, and to this end all the steel cases were loaded into the last coach of the train, Coach 13, where the guard could keep a constant watch on them. The man employed for the job was a Mr. Lyons, Mr. John Lyons, a mature and trusted employee of the railway company. Here, strangely, Mr. Masterson stopped and smiled. I, uh, I inquired whether he had ever worked on the French railways. Guard Lyons, you see? Guard de Leon? Holmes smiled politely and nodded. Oh, forgive me, gentlemen, I can never resist a pun. To continue, the train left Bristol at three this morning, as scheduled. But when it arrived at Paddington at six, the steel boxes of gold were gone. Mr. Holmes, this was an impossible robbery. The train stopped only once for a minute or so to take on water. Hardly time to unload a single box of bullion, let alone a hundred of the darn things, weighing in at a hundred and fifty pounds apiece. And the guard? asked Holmes. Lyons claimed that he fell asleep somewhere near the journey and woke to find the bullion disappeared. He's being held at Paddington along with the driver and engineer, but all ardently protest their innocence. And with regard to other suspects, can you think of anyone in your organization who might feel inclined to take advantage of you? Masterson pinched his lips and looked embarrassed. Well, if I may confide something to you in the strictest confidence, my estranged wife, Laura 
still has shares in the company. She believes that she should have more. There is, uh, some bitterness in this regard. However, I know Lara well enough to doubt that she is a thief. My friend simply said, Thank you, Mr. Masterson. I will certainly take the case on. Would you be so good as to wire Bristol and inform them that Dr. Watson and I are on our way? I will, sir. You mean to go there today? Indeed, yes, as soon as I have made a check or two at Paddington Station. Well, I surely thank you. I can think of no better hands in which to leave the case of the bad luck special than those of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Holmes did not smile. I never leave anything to chance, Mr. Masterson. Perspicacity and reason are the tools I employ. Forgive me, Mr. Holmes. As I say, I am fatally attracted to puns. We will keep you in touch, Holmes said, with all developments. Within half an hour we were at Paddington, but before boarding the Bristol train, Holmes wished to make certain that the so-called bad luck special was secure. The train had been shunted into a siding, and we were relieved to find that police responsibility for the case had fallen to Inspector Stanley Hopkins, a young but ambitious detective with whom Holmes and myself had had numerous dealings in the past. Hearing that we were being engaged by Mr. Benedict Masterson, the inspector agreed to watch over the train and make sure it remained undisturbed until our return to London. It was still raining when we arrived at Bristol, where we met the station foreman, George Willits, an amiable man in his fifties who gave the comforting impression of having been in his job for a lifetime and knowing the whole business inside out. Willits had been on duty the previous night and took us directly to the goods platform from which the bullion train had left. Though he did his best to be of assistance, he looked painfully weary. "'I apologise to you gents for my appearance,' he said. "'But I was on night shift last night seeing out the special. I was just about to go off when the message came from London about the theft, so I've not yet been home to bed.' "'We won't keep you long, Willits.' Holmes said. I understand you were here when the bullion boxes were being loaded. I was, sir. I supervised them myself. Watched them being lifted into the guard's carriage at this very spot, before I sent the signal to bring in the rest of the train. The guard's coach was not connected to the train while it was loaded. That's right, sir. The rest of the train was shunted out of the siding and then coupled up just before she would due to leave. And who brought her in? Tommy Marriott, the engineer, and his fireman, Pat McGlinchey. Old hands? Not quite so much a fixture as myself, Mr. Holmes, but they've been around the best part of ten years. They're sound men. Good. Now, if you'll bear with me a little longer, Willits, I'd like to ask you a little more about the gold itself. How many men were involved in loading the carriage? Well, sir, it was quite some operation. It took four men to load each box, two inside the carriage, two outside. Damn heavy things, if you'll excuse me, sir. Over a hundred weight apiece, and damn awkward squeezing them through them narrow doors. It was a hell of a job. And how long would you say the whole business took? It was about half past midnight when they started, and about a quarter before two by the time they finished, so almost eighty minutes. And after it was loaded, was there any delay before departure? No, sir. The rest of the train, as I say, was reversed in from the siding. John Lyons, the guard, got aboard, and the door of the guard's coach was locked from without, sir, as per our instructions. One final question, Willits, if I may. I'm informed the train stopped en route. Yes, sir. She was scheduled to hold up for a minute or so at Swindon to take on water. It stopped for no longer than that, and at no other time. No, sir. The signalman would know for sure if she'd been held over for more than a minute, and that's already been checked. Holmes seemed to pause for a moment while he considered all this information, and then he said, Well, it's I am most grateful for your detailed and, I have no doubt, accurate recollections. Now, if you will excuse us, Dr. Watson and I will take the next train back to London and leave you to go home and get some sleep. Inspector Hopkins was at Paddington when we arrived and Holmes immediately requested that he arrange for us to speak to the railwayman who had commandeered the bad luck special on the previous night, Marriott and McGlinchy, the engineer and fireman, and the guard, Lyons. In a dark office of the railwayman's quarters, on one of the grimmer outer platforms of Paddington Station, 
the three men sat disconsolately on rickety wooden chairs. It occurred to me that they had by now been detained in this dismal place for several hours, and when Holmes and I were introduced to Lyons, he barely had the energy to nod to us. But he did speak, his words almost drowned in the muffler which half covered his mouth. I dare say you think me a thief, Mr. Holmes, from what you'll have heard. I'm not, sir. But what I have done is derelict my duty, so maybe I deserve what's coming. I want to assure you, Mr. Lyons, Holmes said, that my intention here is to uncover the truth and uncover it I will. If you are, as you say, innocent of any crime, you have nothing to fear from the law. But tell me how you think you failed in your duty. Well, I were meant to keep me eye on the shipment, sir, weren't I? But I fell asleep. It's not something I make a habit of, but this time I did. And woke to find the bullion gone? A nightmare, sir. I suppose I should have stopped the train with a pull call, but I was in a bit of a daze. How long do you think you slept? I thought about that, sir. I remember us passing through the White Horse Valley just before Swindon, and when I woke up, we were about ten miles out of it and past the Lumsey Water Tower. Holmes looked towards the fireman McGlinchey, a plump man with rich black curls. When you stopped to fill the tank, did you notice anything odd? No, sir. It was a dark night, and there were no lights there save the fire from the boiler. You couldn't see twenty feet beyond the train. Holmes turned back to Lyons. I would like you to describe to me the events of yesterday evening. Well, sir, oh, I wasn't due to start my shift until one in the morning, so around about twelve I had a brown ale in the railwayman's canteen and collected some sandwiches and a can of tea for the journey. Just tea and sandwiches? Yes, sir, and, and a piece of seed cake, if that's not too much detail. There is no such thing as too much detail. Please continue with your story. Well, at about half past one, I made my way over to the goods platform. They'd just finished loading the bullion into the end carriage, and the other part of the train had been brought in and coupled up. A gentleman in a suit gave us final instructions. To the engineer and fireman Tommy and Pat here, he said the train was cleared to London, with just the one brief water stop, which was under no circumstances to take more than three minutes. And if there should be an emergency, they were not to leave the cab. At that point, they locked me in with the gold, and at exactly 2 a.m., we were on our way. About a half hour after, I had me sandwiches and a few swigs of tea. It were a clear night, and I sat by one of the windows and watched the stars. Contented with everything, sir. That's when I must have dozed, and, well, what happened after that, you know. Thank you, Lyons, said Holmes. Then he turned to young Inspector Hopkins with a new fierce gleam in his eye. If we may, Hopkins, I should now like to inspect the train. We made our way along the track to the engine sheds, and after checking the locomotive, searched through each of the thirteen coaches whose number I carefully counted myself, until we arrived at the last, the guard's coach, in which the gold had been transported. Now I have been assured, Holmes said to Hopkins, that the doors of this coach were locked from the outside for the duration of the journey. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Yet it was possible to move along the train through the coaches via the connecting doors? Yes. And what of the other coaches? I checked them. Their outer doors were all locked too, but it would have been impossible anyway for the thieves to have moved the containers along the train to jettison them from another carriage. The boxes of gold were too big to pass through the connecting doors. All that had been carefully calculated. But is it quite certain, I ventured, that the boxes could not have been opened and the gold removed bar by bar? Quite certain, said Hopkins. Not without the original keys. They were unique to each box. Besides, Watson, said Holmes, if the boxes had been opened here, then with or without the gold, they would still surely be here now. Speaking of which, Hopkins, the carriage is just as it was found when the doors were first opened this morning. As I said, Mr. Holmes, nothing's been touched. Holmes took an initial sweeping glance around the carriage interior, then stooped to pick something up from the floor. This brown paper, I presume the wrapping for the guard Lyons's sandwiches. Yes. This is can of tea? Yes. Curious that he had a can of tea? No, no. Curious that a man under stress should be so painstakingly tidy. 
I don't understand, sir. Never mind. What do you make of this, Hopkins? Holmes had picked up from the corner a loop of scarlet fabric, silken and ruffled. I don't know, Mr. Holmes. I was completely baffled by it. It seems to be a small decorative item of some sort from a lady's wardrobe. A hair tie, I should think, I said. How might it have got here? I don't know, Doctor, I'm sure. But I suppose it's theoretically possible that someone might have concealed herself in another carriage. Holmes had put the object to his nose. There is a perfume to it, he said, but faint, as though it had not been worn for some time. Could it belong to the thief? I asked tentatively. Possibly, said Holmes, though I think that might have been a thief too many. He stooped to replace the scarlet fabric on the floor of the carriage. I think we are close to a conclusion, Watson. Hopkins, I should like to talk to the guard lions again, and to the driver and his fireman. Please make sure that there is at least one other police officer present, and we must be sure to invite Mr. Benedict Masterson to our little denouement, since he's been kind enough to pay the fee for this investigation. By the time Masterson arrived, the clock was approaching nine, and we sat in the old mess-room bathed in dingy yellow gaslight. The rain rattled ceaselessly on the roof and windows, and, when we were all assembled, the three weary railwaymen, along with Benedict Masterson, Inspector Hopkins, a junior officer, and Holmes, and myself, the gathering became hushed and expectant. Masterson said, "'Well,' This has certainly been a baffling business, Mr. Holmes. But I assume we're here because you've picked up some clues along the way. You are certainly a man equal to his reputation, sir. The inspector mentioned a red silk trinket of some sort. Yes, Holmes said. He produced the item from his pocket. This piece of perfumed fabric. The clear message is that someone was concealed in the carriage with the bullion. I see. And moreover, I put in, that the concealed person was probably female. Masterson appeared a little shaken. Female, you say? Oh, dear. If I may, said Holmes, we will return to that later. Mr. Lyons, let us revert for the present to the subject of your sandwiches. My sandwiches again, sir? Indeed. The sandwiches you took on board the train last night, together with the seed cake and the can of cold tea. You say you ate them just before you fell asleep. Yes, sir. You ate the sandwiches and the cake, you dozed off, you woke up again, and the gold was gone. Yes, sir. That's how it happened. And when you came round and realized the gold had gone, you say it was like a nightmare. Yes, Mr. Holmes. You were very agitated? I certainly was. Too agitated, I expect, to sweep the floor of the carriage. To what, sir? I presume you did not sweep the floor of the carriage at that point, in that disturbed state. No, sir, I didn't. With respect, sir, that's not my job. Quite. I wouldn't expect you to. Which makes it very difficult to explain why, when I examined the guard's coach this afternoon, I found not a single crumb on the floor. Now, can anyone here tell me how it's possible to eat several sandwiches and a slice of seed cake without dropping a single crumb? Or, come to that, a single seed? I promise you, sir, what I said about my supper was true. I remember exactly what I brought and exactly what I ate. I have no doubt of that, Mr. Lyons. Then what, sir? My point is merely that you were obviously not in Coach 13 when you ate the sandwiches. On my honour, Mr. Holmes, I swear I was. Oh, you were in a carriage, certainly, but you were not in the carriage in which your sandwich wrapper was found. The coach where you ate your supper, the coach with the bullion, never made it to London. Mr. Holmes, this is confusing, began Masterson. Holmes interrupted. On the contrary, Mr. Masterson, it's very clear. The coach containing the gold was uncoupled from the train when it stopped for water, run into a siding by those awaiting it, and unloaded of its cargo at their leisure during the night. It was a perfectly dark night. There was no moon. So the railwaymen, 
as Mr. McGlinchey here has recently confirmed, could from the water pump see nothing of what was going on at the back of the train. But Mr. Holmes, said Inspector Hopkins, the bad luck special has thirteen coaches. Everyone knows that. And you will no doubt yourself have noted that we passed through exactly thirteen coaches in our inspection of the train this afternoon. Oh, it has thirteen coaches now, of course, Inspector, Holmes said. And it only struck me after we had left Bristol and its pleasant station master Willits that he had described to us in detail his whole engagement with the loading of the gold and the departure of the train without once mentioning that he'd counted the coaches before the train left. The fact is, he didn't count them. He didn't think he needed to. The bad luck special had always consisted of thirteen coaches. He wasn't to know that your accomplices at Bristol had added an additional coach to the train before it was attached to the coach carrying the boxes. A coach with its seats stripped out to make it practically identical to the bullion car. On that one night, the bad luck special had not thirteen, but fourteen carriages. When the train stopped to acquire water, it simultaneously shed a coach, and it very nearly, he continued, turning back to Lyons, shed a guard, too. You're a very fortunate man, Lyons. I don't feel fortunate, sir. Your good fortune is that you are still alive, and that in turn is because you were fortunate enough to fall asleep. Imagine if you had not. The train stops. The thieves uncouple the rear coach with yourself inside it. As soon as you see them, you become a risk to them. There's no telling what they might have done. What I believe actually happened was that as they were releasing the carriage from the train, someone noticed that you were asleep inside. They took the opportunity to move you into the next coach, along with your tea can and sandwich wrappings. You may be thankful you did not wake at that moment. Masterson wore an expression of amazement. I am full of admiration, Mr. Holmes. But at the same time, I feel somewhat desolated. This clearly means that someone in my organization has betrayed me. Which brings me back to the ring of scarlet silk discovered in the carriage. Certainly an intriguing adornment to the problem, said Holmes. It could indeed signify the presence of a woman. But there is the mystery, I said, of how she got there or what she might have done. I think, however, said Holmes, that is a mystery with a simple solution. At this point, Masterson appeared rather tragically stricken. You're thinking... Yes, said Holmes. You're thinking that my estranged wife, Laura... Dear God, that foolish woman! Oh, come along, Mr. Masterson. You know full well your wife had nothing to do with it. There was no one aboard the train save the three men here, driver, engineer, and guard, and none of them had anything to do with the robbery. The three railwaymen looked at one another as though they had suddenly had revealed to them their entitlement to a joint fortune. As for the thieves, said Holmes, they are to be located somewhere nursing a hoard of bullion, apart, of course, from their paymaster, who is sitting here with us. Is that not so, Mr. Masterson? Masterson blustered and steamed. He was outraged. This was absurd. How dare you, sir? What evidence have you for such an outrageous suggestion? I had misgivings from the beginning. I could not understand why you came to me so quickly after the theft had been discovered when you had so much else to deal with. I see now that you were at pains to demonstrate to the insurance company that you were doing all in your power to recover the bullion because, of course, if you could have both the gold and the insurance money, you would have considerably augmented your fortune. But worse still, what your partners in crime would have done to Mr. Lyons... Had he not had the good sense to fall asleep on the job, hardly bears thinking about. You were prepared not just to steal, but to be an accessory to murder. This is speculation, Mr. Holmes. This would not stand up in court. You should be looking for another felon. What about that red silk ring? Ah, uh, yes. You've been very subtle about that, Mr. Masterson. "'suggesting your wife's name one moment "'and the next assuring me that she could not possibly be implicated. 
I doubt whether you thought she would be, but you certainly sought to throw me off the scent. What was that item, if not a red herring? And is that not, for those who like to play games with words, another way to say, a red herring? What fun you no doubt planned to have with that joke, Mr. Masterson, had you got away with this business. Now it seems the joke is on you. That was one pun, Mr. Masterson, which you would indeed have done better to have resisted. But whether justice was fully done is a moot point. In expectation of reducing his own sentence, Masterson eventually divulged the names of his accomplices and led police to the embezzled bullion. And although he was committed to prison for several years, it was clear that once his sentence was served, he would continue the life of a wealthy man. I can't understand, I said to Holmes a couple of evenings later, why you seem so damnably happy. A man is never more content, Watson, he said, than when doing well what his nature has fitted him to do. On which thought, will you pass me the tobacco pouch? I think we should indulge ourselves in a brace of good pipes. Trinity Vicarage Larceny One fine spring morning, Sherlock Holmes and I received into our rooms a portly gentleman in a purple dress. That at least is how it momentarily appeared to me as I glanced up from the Daily Chronicle at the open door. The purple gentleman, it transpired, was the Right Reverend the Lord Bishop of Kent, an old acquaintance of Holmes, and he had brought with him, as so many of our visitors do, a problem that was clearly causing him some agitation. Mollified a little by coffee and a cigar, Bishop Spriggs needed no prompting to divulge his story. The nub of my problem, gentlemen, is an unfortunate young priest a young man of promise and talent, very popular with his parishioners, who has inadvertently got himself into deep water. Intriguing, said Holmes. You may recall, the clergyman continued, that Trinity Church in the Kent village of Hatchingham was last year in the news because of an exceptional discovery. Of course, I said. A silver chalice of considerable worth was discovered in the crypt. Yes, Dr. Watson a magnificent medieval relic, the so-called Hatchingham Grail, weighing some twenty-two pounds. With my approval, it was sold to the British Museum, with the idea that a good portion of the proceeds would go towards restoring Hatchingham Church. The Reverend Kingsley, pending the beginning of the building work, had locked the money up in the church crypt. It was stolen yesterday. Holmes, you can imagine what an outcry they'd be if this found its way into the papers. It would be bad for Kingsley and the Hatchingham Parish, and goodness alone knows what it would do for the reputation of the church. At any cost, the money must be recovered and the thief put away. And I mean any cost, Holmes. Let us not concern ourselves with fees just yet, Holmes said. Are there any clues? at all, as to who might be responsible for this theft. I'm not sure about clues, replied the clergyman. Kingsley did make some sort of an attempt to discover the identity of the villain by chasing him over the fields after the theft, but I'm afraid he didn't get very far. I think we had better meet the young reverend, said Holmes, as soon as is practical. Watson, would you be at liberty to accompany me to Hatchingham for a few days? I'm utterly indebted to you both said the bishop. I dare say while you're in Hatchingham, we could put you up at the Trinity Church Rectory. Or oh, there's the Jolly Bulldog, if you'd prefer an inn. Ah, said Holmes, the Jolly Bulldog. Now that sounds like just my kind of animal. We journeyed to Hatchingham the next morning and established ourselves at the cosy but crumbling hostelry that was the Jolly Bulldog. Our landlord was a bluff man called Starkey. 
taller by inches than Holmes, and compelled to stoop to avoid the beams of his own ceiling as he lumbered about in heavy boots serving his customers. He grudgingly provided us with a late snack of bread and some rather tough cold meats, complaining that if everyone chose to be fed at half-past two in the afternoon they would have to invent a new word for the meal taken between luncheon and dinner. Leftovers, said Holmes to me impishly and at a level which I am sure Starkey was meant to overhear. Might be that word? The publican growled ominously as he left us, and I leaned over to Holmes and whispered, There is surely an example of how a little power may go to the head of a man and make him too big for his boots. I was thinking rather, said Holmes, from the way he clumps about this place, that his boots are rather too big for him. I saw the two gentlemen on a nearby table smile at this remark. "'I shouldn't take a lot of notice of Starkey,' said one of them amiably. "'He's just as tiresome with all the customers.' The gentleman introduced himself as John Hapton and his companion as Matthew Winslow. Although neither Holmes nor myself disclosed the details of our mission to Hatchingham, it seems they knew we were expected, and it turned out that both gentlemen were members of the parish committee and were fully apprised of the theft, though they were quick to assert that it was not yet public knowledge. "'I hope you will be successful,' said Hapton, "'in bringing this thief to book. "'We are fond of our vigour, "'and he has been a deeply troubled young man since it happened.' The Reverend Kingsley's house was accessed from Hatchingham Lane by a short stone path. A few steps beyond the vicarage stood the church, with, on the west side, a moderate-sized graveyard. On the other side, with its own access to the lane and shaded by a handful of fruit trees, stood Cherry Cottage, which we would later discover to be the residence of the verger and his wife. The Reverend Kingsley was a man in his early thirties, small in stature but of good looks, his clerical dress the quintessence of neatness. While clearly stricken by his predicament, he remained calm and articulate and did his best to make us welcome in a pleasantly appointed parlour whose deep-coloured, thick-piled carpet and embroidered cushions evidenced a delicate sense of taste. "'It's a relief to see you, gentlemen,' he said. The bishop told me all about you, about your many successes in solving complex cases. The problem, as you know, is that while we saw the thief escape, we were unable to establish his identity. However, there are one or two factors which, though they seem opaque to my own consideration, might prove illuminating under your own, if I might show you. I would be most grateful, Mr. Kingsley, Holmes said. First, though, I see that you have recently held a meeting in this charming room. I presume that apart from the three other gentlemen present, the fourth was yourself? You keep the side chairs in another room, I take it. Good Lord, how did you know all that? Oh, it's a simple matter. The carpet beside the window has indentations of four chairs, and therefore I presume four, four people, but there are no chairs in the room whose feet would match. Well, yes, you are. Of course, quite correct, said Kingsley with a broad smile. The parish committee convened here just yesterday, as, as we do each week. Yesterday was the day I broke the news that the Grail money had been stolen, and I hope that that news will remain privy to the committee members until such time as the thief is caught, but... The vicar paused, and Holmes said, Please, go on, Mr. Kingsley. But, continued the young clergyman, the gentlemen on the parish committee are the same three who sat here two weeks ago when I revealed that the money for the grail was in the crypt of the church. Only they and I knew of the fact, you see, so I can no longer be as confident as before that they are all honest men, which is a most unfortunate thing. It was all in cash, I presume, Holmes said. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I kept cash so that I could employ local men to restore the church and pay them by the day. I have little time to run to the bank and make a withdrawal every time a man finishes plastering a wall. The money was under lock and key. Yes, there is a safe in the crypt where the church's small treasures have always been secreted. And the crypt itself is locked? Yes, it can be entered either from within the church or by a door leading from the churchyard, and both those doors are locked at night. Mr. Holmes, I do hope you can help me with this. I don't know how my flock will ever forgive me if that money is not returned. 
Then perhaps, if you can bear to go over it all again, you'd be so kind as to tell Dr. Watson and myself the circumstances of the robbery. Yes, of course. Two weeks ago, looking out of this window on a Monday morning at about eleven, I saw a man, I'm fairly certain it was a man, standing at the lich gate and looking over into the churchyard. I would not have given this a moment's thought, except that he wore a hat with an unusually wide brim, and had it pulled so low over his eyes, and his collar so high, that one could not distinguish his features. As I say, I cannot even be certain it was not a woman, except for his way of moving. I watched him for a good ten minutes before he turned and strode back along the lane towards the village. That same afternoon, this time from an upstairs window, I saw him again, but now further along the lane, standing under a tree and once again seeming to study the church and its grounds. His contrived anonymity naturally put me on my guard. In the evening after those first two sightings, I was sitting in that very chair, Dr. Watson, which you are currently occupying, when a thought hit me like a bolt of lightning, a thought which you no doubt will be surprised had not occurred to me earlier, that this stranger might have designs on the money in the crypt. After this alarming epiphany, I spoke to my verger, Sam Manners, and his wife, May, who keep house for me. They live in Cherry Cottage, which, as you will have seen, stands on the lane beside the church's lich gate. There's a shortcut from their back door to this house, which they employ when they wish to see me. I mention that because, as I think you will agree, it bears upon the matter. I asked them to report to me if this sinister figure, or anyone else unknown to them, appeared in the vicinity of the church. And indeed, it seems as if the man in that hat had begun to watch my whereabouts, because first May Manners, then her husband, reported to me that they had indeed seen the man in the hat. I began to feel that an attempt on the money was imminent. I resolved, then, to remain in the vicarage or the church grounds until I was certain that the threat had passed. I instructed Mr. and Mrs. Manners that if they saw the stranger again, they were to take the shortcut to my house and inform me immediately, but they were under no circumstances to approach him. And now we come to the day of the theft. Sam Manners was whitewashing the walls of the church. At this point, Holmes stood up. I think it would be as well, Mr. Kingsley, to acquaint ourselves with the geography of the church and its grounds. Might we continue outside? A rapturous afternoon of sunshine and birdsong greeted us as we left the vicarage and walked out into the churchyard, where the Reverend Kingsley commenced our guided tour. I immediately began to locate us on a mental map of Hatchingham Village and its surrounding areas, a practice I learned in my military days and which has served me well in civilian life. I could see in my mind the large oblong of farmland, about two miles across, with Hatchingham Village and the church almost at opposite corners. This substantial area of land was surrounded on all four sides by public roads. Mr. Kingsley took us through the grounds on a grassy path which ran along the side of the church up against the gravestones of the churchyard. This is the wall of the church Sam Manners was painting that morning, said the vicar. He worked for a couple of hours, and at twelve o'clock I sent him off to his cottage for his regular midday meal. I went back into the vicarage and took up a book. After about twenty minutes there was a knock at the back door. Mrs. Manners was in a frantic state. She and Sam had just seen the man in the white-brimmed hat going into the churchyard. I told her to return immediately, and to tell Sam to meet me here at the crypt door, and I came here directly to find myself staring at a spectacular mess. He pointed to a flight of four steps just off the path, leading to a door low down in the half-painted church wall. The door to the crypt, he said, from which the thief must have made his exit, and not expecting to encounter a paint bucket, presumably kicked it flying in his haste to escape. A residual expanse of powdery white, still damp in places, stained the flagstones at the bottom of the steps. Sam was with me within seconds, continued the vicar. We could see nobody, but we soon guessed which way he'd gone. If you'll follow me, gentlemen? The vicar led us a little further along the grassy path, to where the churchyard ended in a wooden fence. Set into the fence was a stile leading on to a footpath. That, said the vicar, was his escape route. 
Beyond the stile, the ragged footpath traversed the meadow through weeds and rough grasses, stretching away into the distance. Along this narrow track could be seen intermittent blobs of white. And I suppose the presumption would be, said Holmes, that the trail of white paint marks are the fleeing man's footsteps. Yes, exactly. Obviously our man escaped across the field to Harding Lane, Mr. Holmes. My companion nodded. He stopped at the stile. There are two white handprints here, he said, a right hand and a left hand. The fellow is in some haste, as indeed one would expect. Holmes crossed the stile athletically and walked a little way into the field. Bending down, he examined one of the white marks, then plucked up a handful of grass and returned to us. Thank you, Mr. Kingsley. I think I've seen all I need to here. Is there anything else you think might help us? Yes, said the vicar enthusiastically. Back at the house. Holmes requested that Sam Manners and his wife join us in the vicarage, and a little afterwards in Mr. Kingsley's kitchen. Mrs. Manners set herself to the task of making us all tea, while Holmes paced the stone floor slowly. I sat at the kitchen table with the vicar and Sam Manners, a ruddy man in his early forties, whom Holmes was now addressing. So, Mr. Manners, you are the only person to have caught a glimpse of the man in the hat on the day of the robbery. I believe so, sir. I was at the window, taking my lunch. I saw this fellow in the big hat looking up and down the lane a few times, as if to check all was clear, then enter the churchyard. Straight away I said to Mrs. Manners to go by the back door and tell the vicar. And you yourself waited in the cottage until Mrs. Manners returned. I did, sir. For how long? Not more than two minutes. She told me the vicar wanted me to meet him out by the church. I dashed right out. And found the Reverend Kingsley waiting for you? Yes, sir. And the door to the crypt wide open, whitewash everywhere. Hmm. The crypt door had been locked before you went to lunch. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes, it always was. And that was when you noticed the trail of paint. Exactly, sir, and set off to follow it. You must have only been a short way behind the thief. Must have been, sir, but he moved like the wind. We was across that meadow in less than five minutes. It was a good four furlongs and never caught up to him. But what we found at the opposite side clinched it. Here Mr. Kingsley interrupted. Sam means this, he said, and produced from a drawer a wide-brimmed black velvet hat, inexpensively made and in shape rather resembling the sort of thing one sees worn by picadors in pictures of bullfights. Holmes took the hat and turned it around in his hands. "'It was me found it, sir,' said Manners. "'I was running a bit ahead of the reverend, hoping to catch up with our thief, and as soon as I was over the stile I saw it in the grass by the road, just where I suppose it had fallen from his head.' "'Well,' said Holmes, "'while I cannot see yet how that will help us, with your permission I shall take it away with me.' "'Of course,' said the vicar. "'We'll leave you then, but by way of that path across the fields. "'I'd rather like to follow the route taken by our escaping felon.' "'And so it was that we made our farewells "'and set out from the churchyard across the wide meadow towards Harding Lane. "'Although it had been a week since the church thief had fled, "'there remained a clear trail of white footprints "'across the entire width of the field. "'The path ended at another stile, which gave on to the shaded narrowness of Harding Lane. We calculated that to return to Hatchingham Village we could go in either direction around the perimeter of the meadow. We took the route west along the Pincham Road rather than going east and back via the church. As we walked, my companion looked repeatedly this way and that into the fields at the roadside, the patches of scrubland, and the bushes and trees. If you note anything, you must let me know, Watson and I agreed that I would. But the fields lay bright and innocent in the late afternoon air, and the trees were populated only by birds jubilantly enjoying the sunshine. Then, as we crossed a bridge over a gurgling stream, Holmes stopped halfway. There's something there. Do you see? He pointed to the bank of the stream, above which a hawthorn overhung the rushing water. Something that bush— a pair of somethings, unless I'm mistaken. We clambered over the balustrade of the little bridge and dropped onto the bankside. The hawthorn was thick, and even at close quarters my eyes were at pains to penetrate into its depths. 
Holmes, using a fallen branch the thickness of his arm, smashed his way into the bush. His soft cry of triumph told me he had found something, and he reached in and retrieved in one hand a large pair of leather boots. What do you think, Watson? Is this or is this not the footwear of our thief? They're certainly large, those of a very big man, I should say, and there are white marks on the soles. Shall we see how they fit those prints on the church meadow? I think we can assume that much, Watson. But what would induce the villain to jettison his boots here? Perhaps, I said, he thought he was still being chased, and knew that if he were caught wearing them he would be recognized straight away. Equally suspicious if he'd been found with no boots at all, said Holmes, though I suppose he may have carried a spare pair of shoes with him. Watson, it is fairly clear to me the thief is a local man. Why, unless he feared to be recognized, would he indulge in such an elaborate disguise? Let us go back to the jolly bulldog. That, after all, is where the locals like to congregate. In fact, on our return to the inn, we found John Hapton and Matthew Winslow, the parish committee men we had met earlier, having returned to, or perhaps never having left, the same table. As we sat down, Holmes placed beside him on the floorboards the pair of boots we had found in the hedgerow, causing the two gentlemen to look at them inquisitively. When Starkey, the landlord, arrived to serve us, the first thing he said was, "'Your boots, gentlemen?' "'Not ours.' said Holmes. We found them in a bush in Harding Lane. Strange what some folks will throw away, said the publican. They looks in prime order to me. Hardly been worn, Holmes replied, and then he asked, Would these boots fit you, Mr. Starkey? And seeing our companions on the nearby table watching, he added, Or either of you, gentlemen? Not me, sir, Starkey replied, rather more amiably than I had expected. I know my boots look weighty, but my feet ain't so big as you might think. It's just I'm subject to blisters. But you find big boots help your blisters? I asked, my experience of patients suffering with that condition telling me the opposite. No, sir. To start the blisters, I need to put on three pairs of thick hose, so I always get my boots well over my proper foot size. Then, rather sardonically, he said, Thank you, though, for asking, sir. Mr. Hapton, on the next table, asked, "'Do you mind me asking you, sir, what's your interest in boots?' Holmes said, "'It's an investigation we are conducting in which boots have, well, some scientific significance.' Then to me he whispered as our neighbour turned away with a disbelieving grimace, "'It's as I thought, Watson. We have our culprit.' "'Starkey? No, no, not Starkey.' One of these? And I indicated with my thumb the two men from the parish committee. No, Watson. Who, then? These boots, Watson, do you observe nothing untoward about them? No, not at all. They're practically new. They're of a large size. Apart from that, they are undistinguished. On the contrary, my friend, I would say they were distinguished by a lack of paint. I beg your pardon? I mean, Watson that there are white marks on the soles, to be sure. But tell me, pray, how a man with his hands covered in whitewash could have unlaced and removed his boots without leaving marks on the laces? I don't know, I said. But it would be a singular coincidence if someone completely innocent had jettisoned a pair of boots with paint on the soles. There is no coincidence, Holmes said. These boots were undoubtedly left here by the thief, but not in the way we were intended to believe. Are you suggesting that you know who the thief is? The thief, Watson, is the Reverend Kingsley himself. But how could it be, Holmes? There was no time for him to escape across that meadow and return to the vicarage in time to meet Sam Manners outside the church. How can a man chase himself across a meadow? As you know, Watson, we are due to meet the bishop this evening at Trinity Vicarage. So let us finish our meal. I will explain everything there. We had promised the bishop an interim meeting at the vicarage to advise him of our progress in the case, which no doubt the clergyman expected to be only moderate this soon after our previous meeting. But we had hardly settled to our sherry in Mr. Kingsley's comfortable parlour than Holmes declared dramatically, You will no doubt be delighted to know, gentlemen, that Dr. Watson and I have solved the case.
I did not think it my business to confess that after my previous conversation with Holmes I was as much in the dark as anyone, but I sat quietly sipping my sherry while I watched my friend open the bag we had brought from the inn and remove the two large white-stained boots we had found beside the stream. The bishop's eyes widened. I have to say he looked incredulous. Mr. Kingsley, too, wore a sceptical smirk and raised his eyebrows. Please tell us, Mr. Holmes, what you think you have found? Dr. Watson and I found these, Holmes explained, in a bramble bush in Harding Lane. Big boots suggested we were seeking a big man, yet the footprints told us his stride was short. It was our landlord at the Jolly Bulldog who enabled me to understand the dichotomy. He is a man who buys bigger boots than his foot size in order to accommodate extra socks. Our villain, however, bought his bigger boots in order to accommodate another pair of shoes, leaving the footprints of a bigger man than he is himself. Is that not so, Mr. Kingsley? The young vicar, I thought at the time, if he was guilty of anything, was heroically cool about it. He betrayed nothing but genteel surprise. Are you suggesting that I was the thief, Mr. Holmes? Holmes, said the bishop gravely, from what I understand, Mr. Kingsley and his verger practically managed to catch up with the thief on that fateful day. What on earth do you think is the evidence for this assertion? My lord, Holmes said confidently, Mr. Kingsley wished to embezzle the money raised by the sale of the Hatchingham Grail and decided to construct a piece of theatre which would deceive investigators. He not only invented the spectral man in the large-brimmed hat, he also on several occasions paraded in the hat and the high-collared coat and ensured that Mr. and Mrs. Manners caught a glimpse of him. On the day of the theft, having sent Sam Manners to lunch, he came back here to the vicarage, assumed the disguise, showed himself at the cottage window where Manners was eating, and proceeded into the churchyard. Dashing back to the vicarage again, he slipped out of his cloak and hat and waited for Mrs. Manners' knock on the door. He told Mrs. Manners to summon her husband and rendezvoused with him outside the crypt door. And then what? said Mr. Kingsley, insolent with fury. I put on these boots, unlocked the church, went down to the crypt, took the money, escaped the church, jumped the stile, and ran across a mile of the field, then dashed a mile back, took off the boots, and waited calmly for Sam to arrive, whereupon I went chasing off across the field again. That would indeed have been ingenious, to do in two minutes what an athlete could not do in twenty. Yes, indeed. The question, as my friend Dr. Watson has clarified, is precisely... How may a man chase himself across a meadow? And the answer, asked the bishop. No one will ever know at what point you took the money, Mr. Kingsley. As the keyholder, you are free to do it at your leisure. And, for all one knows, it may never have been in the crypt safe in the first place. Certainly there was no need for you to waste time on it on the day we are discussing. You wished to ensure there was just enough time with Mr. Manners at lunch for you to get to the crypt door and kick over the whitewash bucket. And, of course, you had given Mr. Manners the task of whitewashing that particular part of the church wall, simply to ensure that there would be a bucket there to be upturned. That was all you needed to do, because, and here is the thing, you had made the footprints across the field on the night before. You had also, I have no doubt, planted the boots in the hedgerow on the same occasion, making sure they had plenty of white paint on the soles. Foolishly, you forgot to daub a little on the shoe laces. At this point, the vicar dropped into a chair as though all resistance had suddenly fled him, and I believe that as Holmes proceeded, we all realized that he was now approaching a devastating conclusion. At some hour of that night, Mr. Kingsley, having splashed so much whitewash on the underside of the boots that your hands were gloved with paint, you planted your white-printed trail along the footpath across the meadow to Harding Lane. Afterwards, you dropped the wide-brimmed hat by the stile and jettisoned the boots in a bush further along Harding Lane. The trail of prints was therefore neatly in place for the deception next morning, and I dare say you were solicitous to keep Mr. Manners away from the stile, where he might prematurely stumble upon your, if I may so misname it, handiwork. But one moment, 
said the bishop. If Mr. Kingsley had dropped the hat the night before, how could he have been wearing it that morning? Well, of course, that's simple, said Holmes. There were two hats. And finally, there was the question of the keys. What question was that, Holmes? I asked. I don't recollect any mention of keys. Precisely. There was a distinct absence of any such mention. Why? Because a key would have been needed to enter the crypt, and Mr. Kingsley thought it better not to raise the tricky matter of how such an intruder might have got hold of one. The pale face and slumped figure of Mr. Kingsley indicated his utter defeat. The bishop clearly needed no further convincing. The money, Kingsley, he said. Have you spent it? The vicar looked bitter. I'm a gambler, Bishop, and the truth is that over the years I have burdened myself with appalling debts. I started to use the church money bit by bit. I meant to return it one day when I had a big win, but money runs through my hands like water. There's little of it left. Then it's a matter for the police, the Bishop said, and we must find a new vicar for Hatchingham. I fear that you, Mr. Kingsley, will for many years be the incumbent of a much dingier parish. The 1059 Assassin It is now well known that the investigations of my friend and companion Sherlock Holmes, which I have had the privilege to document over the years, represent only a small portion of his life's work. Many other cases have fallen into the obscure well of history, but nothing departs this world without leaving some trace or memory, and now and then an old story rears its head. So it was with the events of the Stovey murder. A letter came to Holmes one morning at our Baker Street apartment from Samuel Carpenter, an elderly publican at the Horse in Colours hostelry in the Kent village of Stovey. Several years previously, Samuel Carpenter had been a witness at the trial of Arthur Weeks, a local villain accused of intimidation, abduction, blackmail, and grievous bodily harm. Holmes had been involved in helping police on the case with footprint evidence, and thus had come to meet the amiable publican. I suppose we never expected to visit the quiet settlement of Stovey ever again, but the letter contained a clear and urgent summons. Dear Mr. Holmes, you did say when we made our farewells four years ago that if ever there should be a day when I had need of your assistance, I was to write to you immediately. I'm afraid, sir. That day has come. A terrible set of events has clouded my life, and I am quite at a loss. Arthur Weeks, that ruthless villain you helped put away, died in jail a few months ago. Ever since then, his son, Henry, has been making our lives a misery. I found my dog, Catcher, shot dead in the field, and twice a dead fox in our water tank. I started getting letters threatening to burn down the inn, telling me I should one day wait in vain for my wife to come home. Terrible things, but all written anonymous. Then he'd brazenly come and drink at the inn, as innocent as you like. Well, last week, our son Jack told Weeks straight there, in front of all my customers, that he'd gone too far, and he'd better prepare himself for some serious consequences. I wish he had not done it. Two days afterwards, Weeks was found shot through the head, and my Jack has now been arrested as a murderer. If there's anything you may be able to do, Mr. Holmes, please come immediately. I knew that Holmes had taken strongly to the publican, so it was hardly a surprise to me when he asked, as is his way, whether I had any pressing engagements over the next few days, and, when I said no, instructed me to pack immediately an overnight bag. Within an hour we were aboard a Kent-bound train. In Stovey Village we took rooms at the Horse in Colours, 
and as soon as we were settled in, sat with our landlord at a table in the bar, where a large fire battled the chill in the air. Holmes said, Now, Mr. Carpenter, the first thing you must do if I am to help you is to answer my questions honestly and accurately. That I will do, Mr. Holmes. Your Jack made a threat to Henry Weeks here in this bar. Yes, sir. And two days later, Weeks was found dead. Dead with a shot through his head, just outside the village where Nightingale Lane crosses the London railway line, and his horse tied up nearby. And they came to arrest Jack when? That very night. But Jack wasn't here, of course. Wasn't here? Jack couldn't have killed him, Mr. Holmes. Jack was already aboard the London train when Weeks was killed. It was off to buy himself a suit for his wedding. I took him to Stovey Station myself that evening to catch the 1059. There weren't a moment when Jack left my sight. I watched him get on that train and waved him off as it left. But the police didn't seem to think that counts for anything. Soon as he got back here next day, they carted him off, and he's now under lock and key in Maidstone Jail. Well, Mr. Carpenter, said Holmes, I accept unequivocally that what you are telling me is the truth. But my sense is that this is going to be a very convoluted business, and I must impress on you the need to be patient. When Carpenter had returned to serving his customers, I said quietly to Holmes, Surely, if what the old chap says is true, the police have no case. Weeks must have had a hundred enemies hungry for his blood, with far weaker alibis than Jack Carpenter. Perhaps so, said Holmes. But I fear the word of a father in defence of a son is unlikely to be regarded in court as compelling evidence, especially when the police have their minds made up in advance. Watson, I've a suspicion that things may get a lot more obscure before they become clearer. Let's make good use of the afternoon by acquainting ourselves with the details of Henry Weeks' unfortunate end. Our escort to the scene of the crime was a local policeman, Sergeant Berry a man of stubborn practicality, whose uniform one suspected must have been artfully augmented to accommodate the spectacular rotundity of his belly. He clearly felt he had better things to do than to accompany a consulting detective to the scene of a crime when the culprit was already halfway to the gallows. Walking from Stovey Village, we arrived at a spot about thirty yards from a level crossing where the main London railway line traversed Nightingale Lane. Dark Hill Crossing. Corpse found here, Sergeant Berry said bluntly. Six feet from the fence. Victim's horse still tied to the fence. Cause of death, single bullet entering just here. He put a plump finger in the centre of his brow. Weapon? A gun, said the policeman insolently. I am aware, said Holmes, clearly irritated, that if a man is killed with a bullet, then the probable source of the missile is a firearm. What I want to know is whether the weapon has been found, or, if not, whether anyone has deduced the type of gun from the type of bullet. No gun found, said Berry. As for the bullet, far as I know, it's still at the end of a short tunnel into his skull. And the horse? Oh, I don't think we can pin it on the horse, sir. The policeman said with a smirk. Sergeant Berry, Holmes was threateningly patient. Are you able to assist me in this investigation, or would it be more convenient to you if I were to apply to my acquaintances at the yard to find me an alternative guide? The policeman looked suddenly chastened. Just my joke, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I can take you to the horse, sir, and to the body. We saw the horse first. It had been stabled with the police horses in a yard in the village, a tall brown stallion with rather frightened eyes. When young, it must have been a formidable creature. Now it looked ragged from a lifetime of hard riding. Holmes looked it over carefully. The animal was skittish, seemingly distressed, and tried to pull away when Holmes held its bridle to examine its head. I watched rather nervously as my friend entered the stable bay and walked round the animal which threatened to jostle him against the walls. Then, when he reached the front of the creature again, Holmes said, There's a mark here, a sharp wound, can you see? On the right foreleg, just above the fetlock joint, was a slender but quite noticeable lesion, apparently caused fairly recently. Holmes turned to Betty again. Was this mark here when the horse was found? I believe so. 
Good. Well, since we seem to be in the business of investigating wounds today, you'd better show us the way to the morgue. Incidentally, Sergeant, how well do you know the accused man? Fairly well, replied the policeman. Do you know whether he has friends, acquaintances, perhaps, of some intimacy? Well, not really that I know of, sir. He was always at his father's public house, and they were ever a close lot. I mean, he... Sergeant Berry stopped. He became instantly animated and businesslike. A gleam came into his eyes, and he said, Look, there's the mortuary, Mr. Holmes, just after the church. I'll leave you to it, if I may. Just thought of something rather urgent I've got to do. And very briskly, almost running, he disappeared back towards the village. Strange, I said to Holmes. What do you think that was about? I think, said Holmes, that I've put an idea into his head. I only hope it doesn't complicate matters. It transpired that a post-mortem on the dead man had been commissioned, but that the police pathologist had only arrived from London that morning, possibly on the same train as Holmes and myself. I knew Professor Yardley a little through my connection with St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington, and he was quite amenable to my assisting him with the matter in hand. He was a conscientious practitioner, and while the cause of death seemed evident, he thoroughly inspected the externalities of the corpse before opening it. The head wound was a clean, almost star-shaped hole, glutted with dried blood. There was no wound on the back of the head, and it was apparent that the bullet had not exited the body. Notwithstanding that there was no weapon at the scene, Holmes said, suicide seems out of the question, wouldn't you say? There are no powder burns to the skin, and, besides, the wound is probably too small for a close shot. I'd say the missile came from some distance. The bullet had, it turned out, penetrated the brow and lodged deep in the parietal lobe of the brain. But, as Holmes had suggested, the hole in the skull was small, and there was not the dramatic shattering of bone one might have expected from a close shot. Suicide, Professor Yardley concurred, was not a possibility. We are certainly looking for a murderer, then, I commented to Holmes as we wandered back towards Stovey. Well, somebody killed Henry Weeks for certain, Watson. But I have to confess that at this moment I have no idea who it was. You don't think we might be wrong about Jack Carpenter, after all? I do hope not, Watson. It would be an appalling tragedy. But then I suppose for one poor soul or another, murder always is. I had hoped that our next port of call would be the horse in colours, for an icy wind had blown up, and I was ready for a glass of beer and the comfort of the inn's blazing logs. But Holmes walked us straight to Stovey Station, where, he said, we must make an important call. I steeled myself against the increasing cold as the last light faded from the sky. The station master at Stovey was Milton Fraser, a man dressed to give the impression of order and precision, his cap fitting perfectly the balding sphere of a small, neat head and a fine silver pocket watch peeping from his waistcoat pocket. Holmes, whose own knowledge of the country's railways is second to none, won his confidence easily. "'I wish to ask you, Mr. Fraser,' he said, "'about yesterday evening. There is a late train to London, I believe.' The 10.59, sir. It was on time? It was, as it generally is. Not much traffic on the tracks at that hour. And do you recall whether any passengers boarded the train at Stovey? Of course I do, sir. Young Jack Carpenter. Just him? Yes, sir. His father saw him aboard. I watched the train pull away myself. And there is no way anyone could have left the train after that. Well, not here in the station, no. Not without my seeing him. Not in the station, no. I suppose it might be possible for someone to alight at the crossing. The level crossing? Yes, sir. The 1059 always stops at Darkhill Crossing for a few minutes. Safety precaution, sir. Thornley Bridge over the Stour is considered unsafe for two trains until they finish the repairs, so the 1059 up train must wait until the 1104 down has come through. And this happens every night. Can't recollect when it last didn't, sir. Lastly, Mr. Fraser, can you recall which part of the train Mr. Carpenter boarded? Second compartment of the third carriage, sir. I'm quite sure of that. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. You've been more helpful than you know. I suppose we now have to consider, I said to my companion back at the horse in colours, as I stared into the flames of the fire, that Jack Carpenter shot Henry Weeks from the stationary train. We must consider it, certainly.
yet I think it rather unlikely. How would Carpenter have known his intended target was going to be waiting there at the crossing? Then what is the significance of the stopping train? Has it any? I'm beginning to think it has, but I must confess to being currently unsure in what way. Well, let's eat and then sleep on it, I said. But at that moment our cosy evening was horribly interrupted. A young woman, hair dishevelled, came screaming into the bar. Mr. Carpenter! Mr. Carpenter! The elderly landlord came rushing in from the kitchen. What is it, Sarah? It's Beth Miller. They've taken her in. Who's taken her? The police. That Sergeant Berry's arrested her. Says he found a gun. What's this? cried Holmes. Who is Beth Miller? Beth is my son Jack's betrothed, Carpenter said. Their wedding is fixed for next month. Beth's a good and honest young woman and gentle as a lamb. I'll see that blasted policeman. Holmes barred his way and put a hand on his shoulder. If I'm to help you, Mr. Carpenter, he said, staring hard into the man's wild eyes. Believe me when I say that it will not serve our purposes to be too precipitous. Dr. Watson and I will go straight to the police station and find out what's happening. I beg of you to do nothing before you hear from us. Having received Carpenter's assurances, we made our way out of Stovey to the police station, a thick-walled stone building halfway along to the next village. Once a brewery, it now had the grim air of a medieval lock-up. It would not be exaggerating to say that my friend and I received a cool welcome from Sergeant Berry, whose domain this appeared to be. "'Yes, sir, I do have a young woman in custody here, and I can confirm that she has been charged on suspicion of murder.' "'And can you tell me,' said Holmes, "'how she is supposed to have committed this crime?' Well, obviously, sir, we don't know all the details yet, but with a bit of imagination, an intelligent person might construe that she had lured Mr. Weeks to Nightingale Lane on some, shall we say, enticing pretext, laying in wait for him, and dispatched him with a bullet as he tethered his horse. And, said Holmes, would this same intelligent person construe that Jack Carpenter had a part in this? Well, yes, sir, that person— assuming he was using his faculties, would conclude that, quite obviously, Jack Carpenter was an accessory before the fact, and therefore equally culpable. Thank you, Sergeant, Holmes said, for simplifying what I, in my sluggishness of mind, had considered a mystifying problem. Might it be possible for us to see the prisoner now? I'm sorry, sir, I couldn't permit that. Or should it wait until I have received authority from my good friend Superintendent Wales at the yard? The policeman licked his lips, pretended to consult a piece of paper on his desk, and said, Well, as you say, you are a friend of the superintendent, sir, I'm sure. Five minutes wouldn't hurt. We were shown to a cavernous room where rusted iron remnants of the brew house remained bolted to the walls and ceiling. The large skylight had been set with bars, and there were no other windows. A pretty dark-haired girl of no more than twenty years sat at a wooden table. She reacted to us with suspicion as we were admitted, but no sooner had the constable left us alone with her, and no doubt largely in desperation, she confided in us readily. "'Miss Miller, we have a limited amount of time,' Holmes said to her, "'and you must tell us everything you can about this business.' "'Yes, sir.' I'll try. I think I may have done something foolish, sir. Foolish? I think I, I were the first to find the body, sir, you see. Well, now, said Holmes, I had certainly not guessed that. I'd planned to see my Jack onto the London train, she continued, but we was held back at the farm delivering a calf, and I knew I was likely to miss him. The train usually stops by a dark hill crossing, so I thought if I cut along Nightingale Lane, I might be able to wave him off. But when I got there, the train was already disappearing across the bridge. Then, a stone's throw from the track, I saw a horse tied up to the fence and something on the road beside it. When I got up close, I saw who it was, Henry Weeks, covered in blood, and next to him the gun. And you picked up the gun? I asked. Yes, sir. Why? Why did you not go directly to the police? Well, sir, because I recognised the gun. I meant to hide it somewhere. 
It was Jack's gun, you see. I failed to conceal my shock. Jack's gun? So you took the gun, Holmes said, because you thought Jack Carpenter might have killed Weeks. Yes, sir. That was my fear. Even though Jack was on the train? I didn't know how long Weeks had lain there, sir. It's a, it's a lonely place, and he might have been there for hours. So that didn't look good for Jack, departing as he did the very same evening. I weren't sure of nothing, Mr. Holmes, except that Jack was likely to get the blame, everyone knowing about the venom between him and the Weeks family. And what, Holmes said, did you do with Jack's gun? Wrapped it in my shawl, slung it on my shoulder and took it home to hide it. But I was unlucky. On the way I passed Sergeant Berry, I, I think he must afterwards have puzzled over my strange burden, for he came day to search the cottage, and that's when I was arrested. But Holmes, I said, if the murder weapon was beside the body, doesn't that at least establish Jack's innocence? Unfortunately not, Watson. The assumption we had made was that the murder occurred while Jack was on the train. If it happened well before that, I fear that either he or Miss Miller here remain the prima facie suspects. But I didn't kill Henry Weeks, sir. I, I, I swear to God. I don't believe you did, Miss Miller. But we have to convince the police of that. Be hopeful. But as we walked back along the lane that evening towards Stovey and the horse in colours, Holmes seemed somewhat less certain. I have little to go on at this moment except instinct, Watson. I do not feel that Jack Carpenter killed Henry Weeks, and I feel even more strongly that that young woman did not do it either. But feelings, I'm afraid, are not evidence. Let's hurry back to the inn and hope the bar is still available to us. Then we can make an assessment of these matters in comfort. The inn was closed to customers when we arrived, but Mr. Carpenter hastily provided us with a bottle of whiskey and some bread and cheese. The fire was still glowing bright, and I sat there for a good hour while my friend went away to ask some questions of our host. Eventually, he returned and reclaimed his seat beside the fire. Can we number the suspects in this case, Watson? Well, apart from Jack Carpenter and the girl Beth Miller, I said, dropping my voice, I suppose Jack's father, our landlord, is another possibility. Yes, and since we know he saw Jack off onto the train, either he or his son would have needed to commit the murder some time earlier. But how early? I've just spoken to him at length. He assures me, and I believe him, that there are plenty of people prepared to swear that both he and Jack were here all afternoon, and Beth spent the day at farm work. Even so, if the police go ahead and prosecute a case against one or all of them, there's a strong chance a jury might find them guilty, based purely on the assumption that they would at some time have had the opportunity. We are not out of the woods yet, Watson. I see what you mean. Our inquiries seem to have stalled, rather. I refilled our glasses from the whiskey bottle, and Holmes puffed at his pipe. Then suddenly he said, The secret is on that train, Watson. I'm sure that's where it is. What time is it? Twenty minutes to eleven. Come along. We might just get there before it leaves. It was an old cart that transported us post-haste along the hold and muddy lanes of Stovey, so that we arrived at the station splattered and not a little shaken. We were, however, in good time to meet the 1059. Unfortunately for us, the station master, Mr. Milton Fraser, was again on duty. Despite his obvious respect for my friend, however, he became instantly resistant on hearing Holmes's request. No, sir. I'm afraid I most definitely cannot hold up the 1059 London train. Mr. Fraser, this is no flippant request. An innocent young woman will spend tonight locked in a dungeon, as will her fiancé, unless I am able to complete certain essential inquiries. I ask only for ten minutes. Mr. Holmes, my reputation may be a small thing by the world's standards, but it is very important to me. Ten minutes is a long time to delay a train. But if I can guarantee you that this will not affect your reputation, can you really do that, sir? Mr. Fraser, you have my word on it. A long, thoughtful pause. Then, very well, Mr. Holmes, I'll do as you ask.
when two minutes later the great black locomotive hauled its clanking carriages into the station, Mr. Milton Fraser went straight to the footplate and had words with the engineer. A wave to Holmes and myself, who were some way along the platform, told us all was clear, and we boarded the train. Holmes went directly to the second compartment of the third carriage, which contained just one late passenger, an elderly gentleman sitting beside what I saw immediately to be the medical bag of a general practitioner. "'If I may interrupt your peace and quiet, sir,' Holmes said, and having outlined his reasons, asked, "'Were you aboard this train last night?' "'I was,' said the older man. "'I take this train pretty well every night.' I am a medical man with a practice in Newbury and a home in London. Were you in this same compartment last night? The elderly physician laughed. <laughs> Creature of habit, sir. Same compartment every night. And do you recollect the young man who, I believe, got onto the train at this station yesterday? I do, as a matter of fact. He sat there, right opposite me by the window. Pleasant young man. Good. Now, sir, the train stopped at Dark Hill Crossing a little way up the line. Do you recall anything unusual about that? Oh, it stops there pretty well every night, but, well, I do remember something, as a matter of fact. The train whistled, as it usually does, to see if the down train is close enough to respond. At just that moment, I remarked a small flash of light outside the train, like the sun reflecting off brass. And the young man, said Holmes, what was his response? He seemed as puzzled as I was. He said he knew the area and couldn't imagine what it could be. Thank you, doctor, said Holmes. He led me briskly from the train. We have just three of our ten minutes left before the train leaves, Watson, but I think it might just be enough. Mr. Fraser was waiting for us on the platform. All done, sir? Uh, one final request, Mr. Fraser. Are these the same carriages and in the same order as made up the train last night? Yes, sir. That doesn't change much. Then I'll need to get onto the line to check the other side of the train. Oh, I don't know, Mr. Holmes. The down train is due. You'll be at too much risk. I shall be quick. And without further discussion, he re-entered the train, crossed the compartment, opened the further door, and dropped onto the down line beyond. At almost precisely that moment, we heard a whistle, and Fraser said, "'By golly, Dr. Watson, that's the down train crossing the bridge!' I waited for a half minute, but when I heard the rumble of the approaching train, I could restrain myself no longer. "'Holmes!' I called. "'Get a move on, for God's sake!' But the last words of my sentence were drowned by the roar of a locomotive thundering into the station and hissing to a halt next to the 1059. I'm not sure what I thought had happened. I could see that Holmes had not regained the empty compartment for a terrible moment. I hovered in a cloud of anxiety. Then his head appeared, between the bottom of the train and the platform edge. He had ducked under the stationary train to avoid the incoming express. Holmes, are you all right? More than all right, Watson, he said as he clambered back onto the platform especially as I believe I can now name our murderer. He turned to the rather shaken stationmaster. The train may leave, Mr. Fraser, but there are conditions. I see there are no facilities for uncoupling a carriage here in Stovey. Correct, sir, there are no sidings here. Then I must ask you to travel to London with the train, and to ensure on arrival that the carriage in which the physician gentleman is travelling is impounded at Paddington. "'Good Lord, Mr. Holmes! Is the doctor a suspect?' "'No, Mr. Fraser. But one might say the carriage is.' Despite his misgivings, the stationmaster was heroically compliant, and directly he had arranged for a message to be sent to his own family, he boarded the 1059, which had now, for one night only, become the 1125, and the train pulled out of the station on its way to London. "'Well, Holmes, I probably don't need to tell you,' I said, "'that I am completely baffled. "'You can be forgiven for that, Watson. "'It has been a puzzling business.' 
but you do intend to explain to me how a train carriage could be a suspect in a murder case. I will explain everything when we get back to the horse in colors, but first I must ensure that Beth Miller is released from that appalling prison and spends tonight in her own bed. It was long past midnight when we sat again in the comfort of the inn. Though I had not been present when Holmes had put his theory before Sergeant Berry at the makeshift jail, he had clearly made a convincing argument because Beth Miller had been immediately released and sat with us now at the rough-hewn table where Samuel Carpenter, bubbling with the turn in fortune, was proving very liberal with his best ale. So, who was it, Mr. Holmes? Who was the murderer? Well, that's not as simple a question to answer as you might think, said Holmes. The simple answer is that Henry Weeks was the murderer. Do you mean it was suicide? I said. Well, Watson, whatever we call it, there is no doubt that when Henry Weeks fired the gun, it was to murder Jack Carpenter. Around the table, Mr. Carpenter, Beth Miller, and I, all wearing similar baffled expressions, sat staring at Holmes, waiting for him to elucidate. Henry Weeks, Holmes said, went to the spot with the intention of killing young Jack. He knew the train would stop there, and he meant to get a shot at his victim through the carriage window. Things seemed to be going well for him. Jack Carpenter was sitting on the stovey side of the train, so Weeks would have had a good view of him from the lane. Here is what I believe happened. Weeks took aim, but at the very moment he was about to squeeze the trigger, the train blew its whistle. My guess is that the horse reared up and kicked the butt of the gun, hence that wound on the beast's foreleg. The gun went off. Ah, said I, that flash of light the physician on the train mentioned. Precisely. The sound of the shot was probably drowned by the noise of the train. The gun barrel now tilted down, its aim sent low, the bullet hit the wheel bogey of the carriage. The mark on the metalwork is what I was so keen to check this evening, and ricocheted back to strike Henry Weeks. So the train wheel was the killer, I said. As I say, one could impute the train or the bullet, or even the horse as accessories, for all were material in the death. But the fact of the matter is that Henry Weeks, in a rather elegant example of poetic justice, inadvertently murdered himself. Holmes and I took the first train back to London the following morning, passing on our way out of Stovey Station the sight of Weeks's lonely death. What put you on to it, Holmes? I asked. I suppose you could say, Watson, that human goodness put me on to it. Not deduction, then. Samuel Carpenter, his son Jack, Beth Miller. Good people, Watson. We were, if my instinct about them was correct, distinctly short of homicidal candidates. Then you'll recollect the nature of Weeks's head wound. Clearly not suicide, as you noted yourself, because of the shallow nature of the wound. But was it a deep enough lesion to have been caused by a direct hit at close range? That set me wondering about whether the bullet might have rebounded. My examination of the train confirmed it. You're quite right about the wound. I dare say it didn't kill him outright. The poor man probably lay there for some while, bleeding to death in the cold. Well, said Holmes, perhaps that bleak hour may have given him time to reconsider the error of his ways. Sherlock Holmes the Rediscovered Railway Mysteries and Other Stories was written by John Taylor and read by Benedict Cumberbatch. It was produced by Fiction Factory and is published by BBC Audiobooks. Books.